Before we dive in to the sermon today and into our new series on the book of Ezra, let's all pray together. Lord God, I thank you for bringing us all out here this evening throughout the rain, throughout the crazy traffic, and just creating a warm and welcoming and hospitable space where we can worship you and learn about you. And I pray, God, that as we walk through Ezra today and over the next six weeks, that our eyes would be opened to what you want to rebuild in our life. I pray, Lord, that we would be bold to grasp onto the promises that you have put and spoken into life in Scripture, and that we would use those promises as a foundation for what we are going to build moving forward in our own lives, in our faith, in this community, in this church, maybe even in our city, God. We love you, and it is just an honor and privilege to get to worship you this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this evening we are kicking off a new series on the book of Ezra. Ezra is a fascinating book because it basically walks us through the process of the Jews reclaiming God's promises after what seems like every single thing has gone wrong for them. And as we walk through this book, we're going to see how they rebuild not only their faith, but they rebuild their temple, they rebuild their community. And then if you enjoy this series, I would encourage you to keep reading into the next book. Uh, It's called Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah, they focus on actually rebuilding the city as well. And we are going to get into the history of all of this in a moment. But before we do, I want you all to think in your mind about the power that a promise holds. What is the power that a promise holds? Maybe think about a great promise that you have made in your life. Perhaps the covenant of marriage, an oath that you might have taken for work. Maybe you've chosen to be a parent and you now have a lifelong promise that you are living out. Or maybe you're thinking about the power that a promise holds because you've seen the opposite end of that. You've experienced a broken promise. You've experienced that disappointment and devastation when someone does not hold firm to a word that they've given you. What stands out in my mind when I first realized the power of a promise was the summer between first and second grade. Now you might be thinking, Jessica, it is impossible for you. Oh, it's already up there. All right. You might be thinking it is impossible to remember that far back, but I can tell you that when something as traumatic as this haircut happens, You remember it forever. (laughs) And I think we have one more picture too. The next one, yes, that's also me. We can thank my mom for finding these. This was the summer of my life where I got the worst pixie cut known to humanity. And here you see uh, evidence that my dad was a mechanic. So while most kids were riding bikes, I was riding a go-kart. And you can just imagine, you know, my pixie cut blowing in the wind. But not nearly as traumatic as this haircut, that summer I also had to have a surgery done. I was having some reflux issues and the doctor said that this simple procedure would fix things. And so basically leading up to this huge ordeal as a seven-year-old, there's a lot that your doctors and your parents have to do to get you prepared for what might be a traumatic event. But I was awesome, I was so brave. We get to the hospital, I'm ready for the surgery. I understood that I basically was just gonna go into a deep sleep, I would be dreaming great dreams, doctors would fix me and I'd be good to go. So the lead up is successful, I'm super brave. The surgery is successful, I'm super brave. And then it comes time to leave the hospital. And before I could leave, a nurse had to come in and basically you know, disconnect like IV and cords and drains and all that gross stuff, but it is important for this story. And I looked at the nurse very seriously before she did anything, and I said, okay, when you remove that, is it going to hurt? And I was totally okay if it was going to hurt. Like, I have been a brave seven-year-old up until this point, but like I do now, even as a seven-year-old, I like to plan for the worst. And so I just wanted her to be honest so that I could prepare for any level of pain that I might experience. And so I asked her, and she said no. And then I said, do you promise? And she said, yes, I promise. I'm like, all right, we'll be good. A moment later, she took out one of the ports and it hurt so bad that I yelled at her, called her a liar, and started bawling. 
And my parents are basically like trying to decide if they should comfort this child or like apologize to the nurse for <laughs> basically getting owned by this seven-year-old. <laughs> but this, this was the moment where I realized the power of a promise and also experienced from what I can remember my first broken promise. But the thing is, this only happens with humanity. Person to person, we are flawed, and no matter what the promise is, we always run the risk of that promise breaking. But as we're going to learn throughout the book of Ezra, with God, promises aren't like that. When God gives a word in scripture, he follows through on that word. When God makes a promise, he speaks the reality of that promise into future existence. And what we're going to see in the book of Ezra is that even when failure and sin and neglecting God can lead to different forms of exile, we can turn to God and at any moment choose to reclaim the promises that he has already put into his word and he has already spoken over our lives. And we can choose to rebuild our lives around those promises. Now, the process is never easy, but through this six-week series, as we go throughout the book of Ezra, we're basically going to see a roadmap for how to rebuild our lives, our faith, our community, and our church. So to begin, I want to give you all a little bit of a history lesson, because if you're anything like me, you spend a lot of time in the New Testament hanging out with Jesus. I don't blame you. I used to think that the Old Testament was really boring and not applicable and really complicated and hard to grasp. And then I spent time learning the history of what was actually happening to the people of Israel. And all of a sudden, I was able to relate a lot more to what was going on in their lives and understand how God was moving in and through Scripture. So for us, in order for the next six weeks to be meaningful, it is important to get a grasp of Israel's history leading up to the book of Ezra so that we know what happened chronologically. But also today, I want to show you where God's promises were sown into this narrative of the people of Israel. So that as we go throughout Ezra, some 100 years after some of these promises were made, you can see them and recognize them. So this sermon is not going to be a traditional sermon. There is going to be a lot of history, but I'm going to try to keep it interesting. And I took a cue from Pastor Ramon, and we're going to have a little bit of a call and response as we go through things, just in case you also got a C in history class like me, and uh, you struggle to pay attention to this. All right? Yeah. All right. We're off to a good start. So a little bit of a timeline. In the 17th century BCE, we are introduced to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the patriarchs of the Jewish people who God promised to make a great nation and settle into the promised land. Everyone say promised land. All right, all right, we're gonna get through this. This is good. Jacob takes the name Israel and he gives this name to a holy lineage of people that come from him. But eventually, due to famine, they are all forced to migrate to Egypt. Everyone say Egypt. Egypt. And then in the 13th century BCE, Moses leads the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, followed by 40 years of wandering in the desert until they eventually settle in Israel and enjoy the land promised by God. But in 1020 BC, they reach this new chapter because that's when the Jewish monarchy is established, with King Saul being the first king. And then Jerusalem is made the capital in 1000 BC under King David. And then the first temple of the Jewish people is built under King Solomon in 960 BC. Everyone say temple. Temple. In 930 BC, however, because of Solomon's idolatry, the kingdom becomes divided and it gets split at this point into Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Everyone say divided. Meanwhile, the people of Israel, they are worshiping false gods, they are breaking laws right and left, and they are doing absolutely heinous things as they are being influenced by the pagan culture around them. And finally, God says, enough is enough. Enough is enough. 
The Assyrians overthrow Israel around 720 BC and Judah is conquered by the Babylonians in 586 under King Nebuchadnezzar, whom I prefer to call King Nebi. This is where Jerusalem is destroyed. King Nebi completely ransacks the temple, takes everything of value from it. He then destroys the temple and the Jews are then exiled as captives to Babylon by King Nebi. Everyone say exile. exile. During this time, however, there were three guys by the names of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and who were prophets, which means that God spoke through them to his people about what the future would hold. Everyone say prophet. And during this period, there are four promises that are named, which are going to come up later in Ezra, 100-something years in the future. And so we are going to take a minute now to go through those promises so that you can recognize them when they come up later in the book of Ezra. I am going to have uh, the text on the screen, so don't worry about flipping between Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. We will have it on the screen. So the first promise we see is in Jeremiah 25, 12. It reads, but when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So here, God is promising that the Babylonians, who just forced the Jews into exile, they will be punished 70 years from now, and also the king himself will also be punished. Promise number two. This is seen in Isaiah chapters 44 and 45. We are not going to read all of that, but I want to draw your attention to 44 verse 28. It says, I am the Lord who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So here we are introduced to a gentleman named Cyrus. Cyrus is not even born yet, and we are told that God is going to use Cyrus in the future. And God promises that both the temple and Jerusalem, so both the physical structure and the community, are going to be rebuilt under Cyrus's hand. And in the rest of Isaiah 44 and 45, we learn a lot more about Cyrus and who he will be. We learn that he won't even be a Jew. He won't worship Yahweh, but God is still going to use him. And we also learn that God is going to provide generously for Cyrus so that Cyrus can provide generously for the Jewish people when they enter into this next chapter. The third promise is found in Jeremiah 29, verse 10 through 14. It reads, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. God is saying that once your time in exile is up, I will bring you back to Jerusalem, bring you back to your home. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So God is promising here that despite Israel's shortcomings, despite their sin, despite their failing, God is still going to take care of them and he is still going to bring them out of captivity when they decide to turn back to him and to pray to him and to seek him with all their heart. He says, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Now the last promise Promise number four, it is seen in the book of Daniel 5, verse 17 through 30. Sparknotes version of this, we're not going to read all of it, is basically King Nebi is no longer in charge, but his heir is ruling, and his name is King Belshazzar. And Belshazzar is not a Jew, so he does not have a relationship with the Lord, and he decides to throw a party, but not just any party, a party where he is going to use the priceless gold and silver that King Nebi had stolen from God's temple which is a huge no-no to disrespect God that way. And not only does he decide to use these priceless goblets, but while he is using them, he and his friends decide to praise and worship 
material items like gold and silver, and they are praising, praising the gods of, of iron and wood and gold and silver. And as they do this, something a little creepy happens, and this phrase appears on the wall. And what they do is they decide to call in Daniel. Because Daniel is very wise, he can interpret dreams, he can explain riddles, and so Daniel comes in, and Daniel interprets the phrase, and basically he tells Belshazzar that he's going to die, and his kingdom is going to be handed over to the Medes and the Persians, and that very night, Belshazzar dies, and Babylon is overthrown by Persia. And so that night, both promise number one that we read earlier from Jeremiah and promise number four from Daniel are both fulfilled. And with that, we are ready to jump into the book of Ezra. And we are picking up this story at what is known as the second temple period. Because remember earlier, they already, bought, they already built the first temple and that has been destroyed. And so we are at the second temple period. And this begins at 538 BC. And the Jewish people are now under Persian rule. A little more background information. Ezra covers the first two post-exilic returns out of three total. So the first return, it's going to happen in chapters one through six under a guy named Zerubbabel in 538 BC. The second happens in chapters seven through 10. And this will be under Ezra himself in four in 458 BC. So this is the two periods that we're going to be walking through during this series. And like I mentioned earlier, there is a third period of reconstruction, which happens in the next book in Nehemiah. So if you enjoy this series, I would encourage you to keep reading and go through the book of Nehemiah as well. Let's turn to Ezra 1 verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah... The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. So right here, we see promise number two is being fulfilled 150 years after it has been made. Verse two, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So the king of Persia here, he is telling the, the captives, the exiled Jews, that they're free to go and rebuild their homeland in Jerusalem. And he calls on his people to support them, which is significant because if you remember I mentioned earlier Isaiah 44 and 45 promises that God's going to take care of Cyrus so that he could be generous to the people, the Jewish people. And with that, promise number three is fulfilled. And now I take you, I take you through all of this because I think often preachers, they, they stand up here and they tell you that God is faithful. And we tell you that God will chase after you and we tell you that God loves you. And we tell you that he keeps his promises, and we ask you to just believe it. We ask you to take our word for it. But most of you are smarter than me, and I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see God's promises in action. Because if you're going to get something out of the next five weeks, if you're going to walk through this process of rebuilding some aspects of your life corporately, if we're going to walk through the process of rebuilding this church and rebuilding our community, you can't just take my word for it that God's got you. You have to know in your head that God has been faithful in the past before you're going to feel it in your heart that God will be faithful with your future. And that knowledge is found in scripture. That knowledge is found by seeing God's promises come to fruition. If we want to have confidence in God, the first thing we have to do is trust in his word. But trust doesn't have to be blind. Trust is built off of a relationship. And as we get to know God, we do that through getting to know his word. The word shows us God's character, but it also shows us his perfect track record. It shows us all the promises that he has made before, 
and all the promises he has fulfilled, and it shows us that his promises are trustworthy and they are true. And once we trust in his word and reclaim those promises, then we can begin this rebuilding process. The exiled Jews, they dealt with their own human brokenness. They faced destruction of their temple. They were ripped from their home, but God promised them that he would rebuild as they turned back to him. And spoiler alert, a few chapters in, we see that happen. God remembers his promises despite our past and despite our sin. And it is my hope that throughout the series, you would not just stop at Ezra and these four prophecies that we have seen fulfilled, but that you would go deeper into God's word and reclaim the promises that he has already spoken over those who love him and those who follow him. I think often we look for God's promises to just drop from heaven. We'll say, I'm lonely, God, send me community. I'm scared, God, please comfort me. I'm anxious, God, please send me peace. I'm empty, God, would you please fill me? Even when we don't feel God's presence, when those promises don't just drop from heaven, we can open up the Bible and we can find him. And you can dig deeply into the word right now when you go home and find what promises you need to hear for whatever season you are currently walking through. Maybe you need to know that throughout this difficult season, God will fight for you. And it would be helpful for you to turn to Exodus and see him fight for the people of Israel. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Or perhaps you're being haunted by your past, and that song we sang earlier really gave you comfort. You need to turn to Mark 10, 45. It says, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And then throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus actually do that and free people from their past. Maybe you're fearful of the future. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Or maybe you are feeling like you are totally alone in this season. And you need to be reminded one more time that God loves you so deeply. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for you so that you could live eternally with God in heaven. Knowing the promises of God is the first step to rebuilding the future. And if we try to do it on our own, we're we're going to fail because we can't build that foundation by ourselves. That foundation will not last. But as we remember God's promises, we can know that just like he did for the Jewish people, God not only redeems our past, but he has an abundant future planned for us. Once you know the promises of God, then you can start the construction process. You can start the rebuilding. Now, as God rebuilds among the Jewish people in the book of Ezra, there are four various levels of construction that we're going to see take place throughout this series. First, there is a rebuilding on an individual level. Then there is a rebuilding of the temple, and then there is the rebuilding of the community. And like I mentioned, there is this fourth level, a rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem that happens in the book of Nehemiah. But we're going to start with this first step, the rebuilding on the individual level. And we're going to turn to Ezra 1.5. It reads, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, those are two of the twelve tribes of Israel, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So we see here that the first level of rebuilding, it happens on an individual level. These people, they were in exile because they had departed from God and they had turned away from God's promises. They had worshipped false gods. They uh, had worshipped things that were of this world that basically just led to complete and utter destruction. Their hearts were not healthy. But step one for them rebuilding their life, it was a heart change. Before they could make any progress on rebuilding their faith, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding their community, they had to turn their hearts back to God. Some of you, you might be desperately wanting to rebuild some aspect of your life, but you're holding on to your old ways. You're holding on to 
things of your past. Your heart is still stuck in the past. And I want this to be encouragement to you that as you seek to rebuild the future, you have to shift your heart in that direction too. Step one is turning your past over to God and with it giving him your heart too and asking him to make it a solid foundation that you can build the future on. After their heart change, verse five, it says that they took time to prepare for the rebuilding. Again, they were not operating under this assumption that God's promises were just gonna fall straight from heaven. They knew that God was going to use them. He was going to use the community for this rebuilding process, for the promises of fruition. And they knew it would take work, but they knew that they had to prepare themselves. So often I think we ask God in prayer to grant us the desires of our heart, or we ask God to remove an obstacle that might be in our, in our path. But often we're not willing to be the instrument that God wants to use to answer that prayer. We're not willing to do any of the work to prepare ourselves so that we're ready when God answers that promise. Because God wants to answer that promise, but why is he going to do it if you're not ready to receive it? But you see, the Jewish people, they knew that they had to come together and they knew that this would be hard work, but because of God's promises from Isaiah and Jeremiah, they could have the confidence in knowing that he would be right there with them every step of the way. And so they prepared for what was going to come. They knew that God would be faithful, and one of the most beautiful parts of this preparation is the emphasis on community. Ezra 1, verse 6 through 7 says, All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. He's talking about the first temple here that we learned about earlier. Probably the same articles that Belshazzar might have used during that prophecy from Daniel. So the most prized pieces of gold and silver that had been stolen from God are being restored. And scripture says that all the neighbors came out to support the process, to offer assistance. The author of Ezra, he puts such a great emphasis on the momentum and support that comes from rebuilding inside a community that the entire next chapter, he takes the time to name all the positions and all the families that came out to support this rebuilding process. And I'm gonna read them all for you. That was a joke, I'm not doing that. It's 65 verses. <laughs> to start off in Ezra 2, it says, now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to their own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, and many more that I do not need to pronounce. And then it goes on to say, the list of the men of the people of Israel. And Ezra then takes 65 verses to name the number of men that came from each family to support the rebuilding process. Again, I'm not gonna read them all for you, but I would encourage you to go home and open up Ezra 2 and just look at it so you can be overwhelmed by the amount of people that it took to rebuild this institution. Rebuilding, it doesn't take place in isolation, but it takes place in community and it takes place through community. Ezra takes the time then after this to say that the Levites were there and the priests and the musicians and the gatekeepers and the temple servants. He names all these different roles. And as I was reading it, I couldn't help but picture us on Sundays. The pastors were there and the musicians and the technicians and the table kids folks and the hospitality people and the greeters. Everyone came out to support the rebuilding and to make the rebuilding happen. And we know that all these people are important in this process and every role is important in the process or else it wouldn't be named in scripture. They wouldn't name the 65 different families that came out 
and the hundreds and thousands of people that came from those families to make this rebuilding happen. But not only did these people just show up to rebuild, but verse 68 says, when they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings toward the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. The Jewish people, they didn't just show up, but they gave offerings. They went one step further. They were giving both of their time and their treasure toward the rebuilding of something that they knew God would make beautiful. The combination of time and treasure, it showed their dedication and it showed their commitment. It was on them to provide so that the temple could be rebuilt. And God didn't just use their energy, he didn't just use their muscle, but he used their finances. Again, God's promises are not just dropping from the sky, but he's using the community, and specifically here, the commitment of the community to rebuild what was necessary. Rebuilding, it doesn't just take place in community, but it is this commitment and dedication that will bring it to fruition. The Jewish people, they repositioned their heart, they committed their time, and they gave of their treasure because they knew that coming home from exile requires us to go all in. And when we choose to reclaim the promises of God, there is no room to focus on the past when God is calling us to put in the hard work and focus on the future. And whether we are rebuilding our faith, rebuilding our church, rebuilding our community, rebuilding our family, rebuilding some other aspect of our life, we will see God's promises come to fruition when we go all in. I hope by now that you all are thinking of something in your life that needs to be rebuilt. We all have experienced exile in some form or another, and are so desperately craving to see the promises of God be sown in our lives. But I'm here to tell you that they are already there waiting for you. For some of you, that first step, it is going to be going home and opening up your Bible and finding out what God promises about the specific thing that you are dealing with, about the specific season that you are walking through. Because we cannot reclaim God's promises if we don't know what they are. But for others of us, you might relate more to where the Jews are in the beginning of the book of Ezra, who are ready to start the rebuilding process, but your heart is still stuck in the past. And you haven't taken the time to turn it over to God, to turn your heart over and to ask God to help you provide grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness for whatever happened in your past to soften your heart and shape it to be a foundation that God can build the future on. And for some of you, your heart might be ready, but you're trying to do it alone, and you can't rebuild alone. You need to make sure that you have prepared and you have invited community into the process. Community is essential to rebuilding whatever season you are stepping into. And finally, for some of you, you may have been trying to rebuild for a while, and your heart is there, and you've made preparations, and you have people around you, but your treasure isn't there. Whatever is most valuable to you has not been turned over to God. You are laboring, but you are not invested. And you're not as committed as you could be. And if you don't fall into any of these categories and you are all the way through all of those processes and you are like, I'm committed. I have done all of these things. For you, I want to encourage you throughout this series to focus on perseverance and to ask God for that. I encourage you to figure out where you fall on this spectrum so that the next five weeks can be the most beneficial as possible. So that as we go throughout the book of Ezra, you can relate And you can learn something from the Jewish people as they go throughout this rebuilding process. Because no matter where you might fall, as we're going to see throughout this book, rebuilding takes a lot of time. But because of God's promises that he has made to us in the past, 
we can be confident in reclaiming them and confident in the future that he has planned for us. Let's pray for that. Lord God, we are so excited to embark on this new season. And I pray, Lord, that as we go throughout the book of Ezra, you would make it relatable for all the folks in this church who are entering into a new season of life. I pray, Lord, that they would see you throughout this book and that they would learn something so deeply from it and change their life accordingly. I pray, Lord, for the folks that are are aching to turn their heart over to you. I pray for the folks that are just so stuck in the past and they want the future badly, but they haven't taken the time to turn over their hurts and their sorrows and their anger and their sadness to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with them as they do that and that you would soften and shape their hearts so that it can be something to rebuild the future on. And I pray, Lord, for for the folks who are entering into this next season, but they haven't found people to support them in that process. And I ask, Lord, that you would build relationships in this church, you would build community in this space, and that we would be a place where people feel just overwhelmed by love and support as they go throughout this rebuilding process. I pray, God, that you also would help folks turn over whatever they are clinging to that they haven't given over to you, that they need to in order to support this rebuilding process. I pray, God, that as a church, we would go all in to this next season that we are walking into. And as everyone in this space is dealing with a different struggle in their life, and as they are dealing with a different place of rebuilding, I just pray, God, that your promises would be revealed to them in your word and that they would find hope in those promises and that they would find confidence in them knowing that you answer promises, you answer the prayers that we make to you. And I pray, God, that you would just build our trust and you would build our faith as we go throughout this season together. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.